The NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, in fact, uh, seems to suggest that Ukraine would have to compromise in a possible negotiation with Russia. In an interview to the BBC, which was published on Saturday, Stoltenberg clarified that the West would support Ukraine in the long term. He said Western countries would invest in Ukraine's defense capabilities to make it more resilient to future strikes. This report puts recent developments into context. Just a few days ago, on the 4th of April, NATO members celebrating the 75th anniversary of the strongest military alliance in history with pledges to support Ukraine to the very end. Today we will address uh, Ukraine's urgent practical and political needs, including how to strengthen NATO support for Ukraine. At Vilnius, we agreed a package of measures to bring Ukraine closer uh, to NATO. And as we prepare for our Washington summit, we are working together to cement Ukraine's path towards NATO membership. This matters for Ukraine's security and for our security. However, the funding plan for Ukraine doesn't seem to have the entire backing of the Security Alliance with reports suggesting not all members agree. NATO chief Stoltenberg had proposed creating a 107 billion US dollars five-year fund to support Ukraine. But the idea drew mixed responses from NATO members. Then came an interview to the BBC published on Saturday in which Stoltenberg has said, and I quote, Even if we believe and hope that the war will end in the near future, at the end of the day, it has to be Ukraine that decides what kind of compromises they are willing to do, unquote. He added that the West's role is to help Kiev reach a negotiating position that could produce an acceptable result. He, however, did mention that he was not pushing Kiev toward any concessions, emphasizing that the real peace can only be achieved with the Ukrainian victory. It is clear that extending support and aid to Ukraine emerged as a contentious topic among NATO member countries as foreign ministers met for two days of talks at the alliance headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, concluding on Thursday. NATO alliance members had agreed to scour their arsenals for more air defense systems to protect Ukraine from Russian ballistic missile attacks. NATO is not party to the conflict, and NATO will not be party to the conflict, uh, but NATO is providing support to Ukraine to help them dem defend themselves. And we just have to remember again and again what this is. This is one country, Russia, attacking another, invading another country. Russia claims it is open to talks with Ukraine, but asserts that Ukraine must accept its borders have changed drastically since the start of the military operation. Ukraine advocates a 10-point peace formula demanding that Moscow withdraws its troops from territories it has occupied, apart from a tribunal to prosecute Russian war crimes. This is a position Moscow says is detached from reality. Ukrainian President Zelensky, in remarks published on Saturday, said his country is awaiting a much-needed large-scale aid package from the United States and that he still believes will get approval from the US Congress. He also hopes the setup of a peace summit in Switzerland with around 100 countries participating. If there is any hint in a change of stance, Zelensky suggested last month that a return to Ukraine's 1991 borders was no longer a precondition for negotiations. He still insists that Kiev must regain its territories annexed by Moscow in 2022. Bureau Report, DD, India. And Dasha Chernyshova now joins us from Moscow with an update uh, on the story from there. Well, Dasha, what is the latest ground situation as per the Russian authorities? Well, indeed, the Russian Ministry of Defense says the operation is ongoing with the Russian military uh, defending their positions and slowly making their advances. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense, there have been also several attempts by the Ukrainian armed forces to attack the territory of Russia with the drones. Uh, we understand that at least uh, one has been intercepted during the day in the Belgorod region, but also several missile alerts have been uh, on uh, in this region that borders Ukraine 
we also have heard from the Russian authorities that there was an attempt to attack the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. According to Rosatom, a uh, Russian nuclear agency that operates the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, three of the employees of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant have been injured as a result of this attack. The nuclear power plant is safe. It has not received any damage, but also the Russian military say they carried out strikes against the military infrastructure of Ukraine, destroying the warehouse with the sea drones of the Ukrainian armed forces that they received from NATO countries. Also, Dasha, what is the Russian position on, uh, you know, possible peace negotiations? Moscow always says that it is open for any sort of substantiative discussions, be it with Ukraine or the West. However, it notes the very fact that Ukraine itself has ruled out the possibility with the Ukrainian leadership signing the law that prohibits the Ukrainian leaders to have any sort of negotiations with Moscow. Moscow also insists that any sort of talks with Ukraine should proceed from the new realities on the ground, meaning that Russia now has four new regions, that is the territory of the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics, as well as the Parisia and Kherson regions that are now considered in Russia as the part of Russian Federation. We also have heard the Russian authorities saying that as long as Ukraine receives weapons from NATO, those negotiations are not possible because Kyiv is not interested in that. And also the position of Moscow is that Ukraine will one way or another come around and get to the negotiations table but obviously Moscow says that the sooner that happens the better so the understanding here in Russia is that it is the West that has not been allowing Ukraine to hold those negotiations with Russia because what Moscow says is happening is the hybrid war that has been unleashed according to the Russian officials by the Western countries against Russia and Ukraine is being used as the uh, proxy in this situation. Dasha Chernyshova from Moscow, thanks very much. Now let's get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. In the run-up to the first phase of the Lok Sabha elections on the 19th of April, political leaders are intensifying their campaign efforts. Prime Minister Narendra Modi conducted mega rallies in Nawada and Chalpaiguri, as well as uh, launching the BJP's campaign in Madhya Pradesh with a roadshow in Jabalpur. Meanwhile, the opposition parties are actively engaging with the public, with leaders uh, like the West Bengal Chief Minister, a house, uh, in fact, hosting rallies in Purulia, and the former Jammu and Kashmir Chief Minister Mehbubada Mufti declaring her candidacy. Let's look at this report. Phase of elections just a few days away, political parties have intensified their political campaigns. All star campaigners of the Bharatiya Janata Party are going to the public and appealing them to vote for their party. Prime Minister Modi on Sunday held a huge public rally in Nevada in India's state of Bihar. Following his rally in Nevada, PM Modi held another rally in Jalpaiguri city of eastern state of West Bengal. Addressing the rally, Prime Minister Modi lashed out at the state government for plundering marginalized people in name of jobs. TMC Vamdal Congress ne ek dusre ke prastacharyo ko bachane ke liye ye indi gadbandan banaya hai. Main kehta hu prastachar mitao. Later in the evening, Prime Minister Modi launched BJP's election campaign in the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. Prime Minister Modi held a roadshow in the Jabalpur city of Madhya Pradesh where thousands of people gathered to show their support. Not only PM Modi but also other star campaigners including JP Nadda and Rajnath Singh held public rallies in different parts of the country. 
On the other hand, opposition parties are also trying their best to woo the voters. West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee held a rally in Purulia district of the state. Addressing the rally, Mamta Banerjee said, TMC is single-handedly taking on various political parties in the state. Indian Alliance Bangla nei, Congress hai nei, CPM hai nei, CPM Congress BJP Bangla ekshate lorai korche. Aur amra tinomul Congress, CPM Congress BJP virudde lorai korchi. Desh god bata bo amra, desh god bo amra, amra hi pot dakha bo. Tinomul ke jato beshi shidde ban BJP stato harbe. Meanwhile, Congress President has approved the proposal for the formation of the Campaign Committee for Rajasthan. The All India Congress Committee on Saturday approved a 32-member campaign committee for the Lok Sabha elections in Rajasthan. In a surprise move, People's Democratic Party President and former Jammu Kashmir Chief Minister Mehbooba Mufti has announced that she will be fighting upcoming general election from Anantanag Rajori constituency and her party will field candidates from Srinagar and Baramula constituency. However, her party will support Congress on two Jammu region seat of Udhampur and Jammu. Now still to come here on DD India News R. Israel to attend the Gaza truce and hostage release talks in Cairo. AUKUS to add Japan as a pillar two addition to the grouping. A British Royal Navy ship is to supply aid to Gaza. of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. Now, in Cairo, negotiations between Israel and Hamas offer cautious hope for a ceasefire with the US, Israel, Egypt, and Qatar at the table. However, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's latest comments add uncertainty to the peace efforts. Meanwhile, recent reports of Israeli troop withdrawal from Gaza may signal goodwill or strategic maneuvering. As the delegations from Israel and Hamas are in Cairo, in a bid to reinvigorate stalled ceasefire negotiations, hopes for a ceasefire are being cautiously entertained. With the negotiating teams including the US, Israel, Egypt and Qatar, expectations are high for substantial progress to be made towards resolving the ongoing conflict. However, the path to peace seems fraught with uncertainty, as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu asserts, that any ceasefire agreement must include the release of Israeli hostages held by Hamas. I made it clear to the international community there will be no ceasefire without the return of hostages. It just won't happen. This is the policy of Israeli government and I welcome the fact that the Biden administration made it clear two days ago that this is still its position as well. I would like to clarify one more thing. Israel is not just the one preventing a deal. Hamas prevents the deal. Meanwhile, in a significant development, the Israeli military has withdrawn all ground troops from the southern Gaza Strip, except for one brigade. This move could signal a gesture of goodwill or a strategic maneuver aimed at facilitating dialogue. The meeting in Cairo holds the potential to pave the way for a lasting ceasefire and a resolution to the hostage situation. The international community is closely monitoring the outcome and is hopeful for a breakthrough in the protracted conflict between Israel and Hamas. And Alex Kadia now joins us from near the Gaza border with more on the story. Alex, uh, 
You know, um, Nathan Yahoo says that there's going to be no ceasefire without the return of hostages. Uh, what's expected then from the ceasefire talks in Cairo? Yeah, well, we know that that Israeli negotiating team has been given what the Israeli officials are describing as an extended mandate. They've given those negotiators more room to maneuver in the hopes of striking a deal. We know that officials have said that previously uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's government had not given negotiators enough room uh, to maneuver to get to a deal. We know that all the right players will be in Cairo. The head of the Israeli intelligence agency, the Mossad, uh, Ronan Barr, the head of the security agency, Shin Bet, and the deputy leader of Hamas, all present at these talks, mediated by CIA Director Bill Burns and Egyptian and Qatari intelligence officials. So in that sense, you have all the right people to strike a deal. But on uh, uh, paper, the two sides are still very far apart. We know that a previous proposal tabled by the United States, agreed by Israel, would have seen 40 vulnerable hostages uh, women injured and elderly released in exchange for 700 Palestinian uh, prisoners, 100 of which are serving life sentences. Now, that deal had been rejected by Hamas because they say Israel does not want to allow civilians to return to northern Gaza. Northern Gaza, right behind me, uh, I'm in the town of Sturot in Israel, but just back there is northern Gaza. At the moment, Israel says they will allow some civilians to return, but not the entirety and not without security checks. That's one of the sticking points. The other two is that Hamas wants a long-lasting, if not permanent, ceasefire and uh, the full withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza. Clearly, those are two issues that the Israelis say are simply not acceptable to them. Nevertheless, all the right parties are in Cairo to try and hash out a deal. Uh, Alex, then what's the ground situation like uh, as, uh, as the Israeli authorities see it? Uh, Netanyahu is also saying that the IDF has eliminated 19 out of 24 Hamas battalions. Tell us more. Well, certainly there is a shift in uh, the fighting at the moment. We know that almost all of Israel's troops are being pulled out of southern Gaza. They're leaving uh, one brigade, about 4,000 men to man uh, a corridor that is between southern Gaza, Gaza in that direction and northern Gaza. Behind me, that corridor to prevent those civilians and uh, all and fighters and all Palestinians in Gaza from returning to the north of the enclave and the IDF saying is a corridor for aid to go in. Now we hear from US officials that that withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza is just so that they can rest and not because they're going to be redirected to another operation or the war is coming to an end because Prime Minister Netanyahu himself has said that Israeli troops will go into the southern city of Rafah. That is where as the Israeli government see it, they need to finish the job. But on that, they still need to figure out exactly how to do that operation because the United States, Israel's biggest ally, says without proper uh, planning, preparation and the full evacuation of civilians, there will be mass casualties. And therefore, the Israelis are still working out a plan on exactly how to evacuate the civilians from Rafa. U.S. officials behind the scenes say that'll take four months. Israeli officials say that'll take four weeks. So clearly, at the moment, uh, Israeli troops being rested, pulled out of Gaza, but almost certainly going back into uh, an operation in Rafah. Alex Kadir from uh, close to the Gaza border. Thanks very much for being with us. It has been six uh, months now since uh, Hamas fighters broke through from Gaza into Israel on the 7th of October, killing about uh, 1,200 people and taking hundreds of people hostage. The UN chief, Antonio Guterres, once again has condemned that attack and he's called for unconditional release of all the hostages. The 7th of October is a day of pain for Israel and the world. The United Nations and I personally mourn with Israelis for the 1,200 people, including many women and children, who were killed in cold blood. Nothing can justify the horror unleashed by Hamas in October 7th. And I once again utterly condemn the use of sexual violence, torture, injuring and kidnapping of civilians, the firing of rockets towards civilian targets, and the use of human shields. And I call for the unconditional release of all the hostages still held by Hamas and other armed groups. The Joint Operations Command of the Ministry of Defense uh, announced the implementation of the 26th airdrop of humanitarian and relief aid 
As part of the Birds of Goodness operation, the United Arab Emirates' Ministry of Defense we're talking about released footage on Saturday reportedly showing its air forces dropping humanitarian aid parcels into northern Gaza in a joint effort with Egypt. Two UAE C-17 aircraft and two Egyptian C-295 aircraft participated in the airdrop operation. Over 80 tons of food and relief material and supplies were dropped over isolated areas in northern Gaza. As part of an international effort to help set up a new humanitarian maritime corridor, a British Royal Navy ship will supply aid to Gaza. The multinational effort involving the United States, Cyprus and other partners will develop a new temporary pier off the coast of Gaza. The British Foreign Minister David Cameron pledged $12.26 million for aid equipment and logistical expertise to help set up the maritime corridor from Cyprus to Gaza. The initiative will see aid pre-screened in Cyprus and delivered directly to Gaza through the new U.S. temporary pier, which is being constructed off the coast or, in fact, via the Ashdod port after Israel agreed to open it. The U.S., Britain and Australia are set to begin talks on bringing new members into their AUKUS security pact as Washington pushes for Japan to be included as a member, as a deterrent against China. The country's defense ministers will announce discussions on Monday on Pillar 2 of the pact, which commits the members to jointly developing quantum computing, undersea hypersonic, artificial intelligence and cyber technology uh, the newspaper a uh, newspaper has reported on saturday citing people who are familiar with this situation AUKUS, formed by three countries in 2021 is part of efforts to push back against china's growing part in the indo-pacific region china has called the AUKUS pact dangerous and has warned that it could spur the region into an arms race in Slovakia, Peter Pellegrini has won the presidential election, defeating Ivan Korchok. Pellegrini received 56.7% of the vote in Saturday's runoff election, topping the former foreign minister Ivan Korchok, who had received 43.3%. And this election result propels Pellegrini to become Slovakia's sixth president since its independence from Czechoslovakia in 1993. The outgoing president, Zuzana Chaputova, known for her support for Ukraine amid uh, the Russian aggression, chose not to seek re-election for the largely ceremonial role. Although Slovakian presidents wield very limited executive powers, they can actually veto laws or challenge them in the constitutional courts, and they can also nominate constitutional court judges, potentially shaping political conflicts over the reforms, uh, which aim to reduce penalties for corruption. Mexico has suspended diplomatic ties with Ecuador after police raided its embassy in Quito. This is to, uh, to arrest the former Ecuadorian vice president, Jorge Glass. Nicaragua has also joined Mexico in cutting all diplomatic relations with Ecuador as a flagrant violation of international law has taken place. Now, Glass had been holed up in the embassy in Quito since seeking political asylum in December. He has been accused of by the Ecuadorian authorities of embezzling government funds meant to help rebuild after a devastating 2016 earthquake. He has now been flown under police guard to the city of Giaquil and also is expected to await trial in a maximum security prison. Meanwhile, Glass says that he is the subject of political persecution and had been sheltering inside the embassy. Glass served as Ecuador's vice president between 2013 and 2017. He was relieved of his duties because of mounting corruption allegations against him. Later that year, he was sentenced to six years in jail in connection with corruption at the Brazilian government, uh, con the construction company, Odebrecht. Well, Zimbabwe has introduced a new gold-backed currency called ZIG, and uh, the name stands for Zimbabwe Gold. So it is, in fact, the latest attempt to stabilize the economy uh, that has lurched uh, from crisis to crisis for the last 25 years. Here's Isaac Lucando reporting. 
The Central Bank of Zimbabwe says the ZIG will be structured and pegged at a market-determined exchange rate. The new currency replaces the Zimbabwean dollar, which has lost three-quarters of its value this year. March saw annual inflation reach 55%, a seven-month high. Zimbabweans have 21 days to exchange their old notes for new currency. Despite this, the U.S. dollar accounting for 85% of transactions will remain legal tender since most people are likely to continue preferring it. There is a historic mistrust of the central bank among Zimbabweans dating back to 2008 when it printed 10 trillion Zimbabwean dollar notes during uncontrollable inflation. Consequently, Zimbabwe abolished its currency and relied on foreign banknotes like the US dollar and the South African rand for many years. Experts are now questioning whether Zimbabwe has enough reserves to adequately back the currency and whether it could suffer from volatility in gold prices. Isaac Lukando in Dar es Salaam reporting for Didi India. And some weather-related news now. People in Paris ditch their coats and jackets as temperatures are set to reach higher in April. The weather authorities have warned that temperatures are, are mounting and are going to reach up to 30 degrees Celsius in the south of France. Experts claim that the warmer weather is due to warm air masses continuing to circulate over much of Europe, France to break the record of the warmest April this month. Now, airline passengers in parts of the United Kingdom and Ireland, they faced travel disruption at airports on Saturday because of flight cancellations. As a storm has swept across both countries and has left thousands of Irish homes with power outages. The disruption caused by Storm Kathleen has affected flights at airports across Ireland and the UK, including Manchester Airport and Belfast City Airport. In Scotland, rail and ferry services were also affected and they faced disruption due to Storm Kathleen, with Scottish rail services implementing temporary speed restrictions earlier in the day. Strong winds associated with the storm also had led to a number of power outages across the country, with approximately 34,000 homes, farms and businesses impacted. Still to come here on DD India News Hour. We'll be discussing what's at stake if Ukraine is asked to compromise with Russia by NATO. Summer heat sets in and uh, Bhuvaneshwar in eastern India records a temperature of 43.5 degrees Celsius on Saturday. Heat wave to continue. A glimpse of the Indian space odyssey sounding rockets to Gaganyaan. And ISRO animation is going to enthuse children. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes. Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs. With a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024. The battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. Here's a recap of our main stories. The NATO chief Stoltenberg indicates Ukraine may need to compromise with Russia. He says that he's not pushing Kiev towards any concession, but asserts that NATO is with Ukraine for the long term.
Netanyahu ups the rhetoric ahead of his teams attending the mediated ceasefire talks in Cairo, says achievements of the war are great, with Israel eliminating 19 out of 24 Hamas battalions. In the Indian general elections, leaders across political parties have hit the heat and dust of the campaign trail as momentum builds up for the first phase of polling on April 19. And returning now to our top story about uh, the NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg hinting that, uh, that Ukraine might have to compromise with Russia. Uh, to discuss the implications of this, we have with us uh, Ambassador Ashok Sajanhar, former senior diplomat, and Major General Sudhakar J, retired strategic and defense expert. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. Ambassador Sajanhar, let me start with you. Is this war too expensive for the West, for Europe, and in particular the U.S. also? Not enough money to support Ukraine to the very end. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, what you say is right, and I think this has been quite clear from uh, the beginning. In fact, uh, Russia had been thinking that uh, such a situation would arise uh, by the end of 2022, because, you know, that is uh, when the winter would set in, and if energy is not coming in from Russia, then there are going to be problems for Europe, and there are going to be dissensions within Europe and also uh, in the United States, and they will not, uh, uh, you know, going forward, agree to fund the war that has been going on. But of course, uh, these uh, countries have uh, withstood uh, and uh, have, uh, you know, for the last more than two years, they have been supporting Ukraine. As uh, President Biden, when he visited Kiev recently, he said uh, that uh, the United States, NATO, and the West will support. Uh, uh, Ukraine for as long as it takes. <coughs> but yes. of course, uh, it has uh, started, you know, it has dawned to the West, uh, both in Europe as well as in the United States. United States, they have not been able to come up with a package because of the depolarization between the Democrats and the Republicans. And also in uh, U uh, Europe, there are a number of countries, number of EU members. Okay. who are not uh, supportive of, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, going in for continuing the funding for sure. Ukraine. Uh, so that definitely is uh, a very important issue. And uh, the war is losing support amongst the people of uh, the country. So that is okay. another issue that is uh, uh, bedeviling uh, the support uh, by the West to right. Ukraine. General Sadakar, uh, keeping... Uh what uh, Ambassador Sajanhar has said in mind, what is the realistic position then for negotiators to take on the Ukrainian side? Mark, uh, good evening. Thank you for getting me to your show. Welcome. Uh, as regards the ambassador, he deserves to have the last word on the subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, having known him so well, uh, perhaps he is, he is, he is an expert on the subject. But let me take a, give you a share of perspective. Today, the world is in turmoil. Mm. When I talk about the turmoil, what it means is the geopolitics has got no semblance of orderliness. There is a domain of multilateralism which is expanding by the day. There is also a domain of USA as the single most superpower asserting its authority and supremacy. And although mindful of the fact that the entire world order knows that it is actually manifested and demonstrated everything to do with a declining power. Okay. So having given this little primer, let me just give you a perspective with regard to the Ukraine that you are alluding to. Ukraine is in a platform of, of uh, the non-existence of a nation state showing very ugly face in real form. When I say this, on one hand, we have the Western alliance or the transatlantic relationship. It's likely to collapse. The elections in the USA is round the corner. The other hand, we have the Soviet uh, or the Russia mm -hmm. uh, as an extension of the USSR or the Soviet Union. 
duly supported by the axis when i say axis what it means is you have china you have north korea you have iran and uh, and uh, the nations which are falling in line okay. to match uh, match the requirement and aspirations of russia as on today so under the circumstances while the dependence on russia had fallen down to 8.7 last i think 6 to 8 months or so if you go by the statistics of the pew Okay. it shows a dramatic rise of dependence on the european countries on russia having gone up to 15.7 to 16% so right. this particular rise is indicative of the fact that not withstanding what is happening happening in ukraine will actually make them fall on line with the natural principles of law and that is yes. the dependence yes. of russia by virtue of the geography and the proximity last okay. but not the least mark if you allow me that yes the cost of uh, the the warfare is increasing i would like to flag the point that the international focus has shifted from the central europe hmm. to the middle east and that too to gaza okay. when i talk about the gaza strip it is the rafa which is actually drawing the attention of the world order and the red sea back to you Okay, uh, Ambassador Sajjanhar, uh, Ukraine hopes to get uh, support for its 10-point peace plan uh, through uh, summits. Now it's hoping that the next summit is going to be in Switzerland. How effective is this approach? I mean, expecting 100 countries to support it. Yes, Ukraine wants uh, its own uh, peace proposal, its own peace plan, to be <clears throat> the focus of attention. And uh, what uh, Zelensky has said recently is. that he would not be averse to inviting a representative also from russia you would recall uh, mark that uh, mr zelensky had earlier stated that he is never going to uh, negotiate with president vladimir putin but of course now we know that uh, mr putin is not going anywhere at least for quite some time so i think there is no alternative for mr zelensky but to negotiate with uh, mr uh, putin when he is there <coughs> Okay. So I think, as far as this uh, summitry is concerned, and the next one happening in uh, Switzerland, I think definitely getting a larger number of countries and identifying possibly one or two countries who can act as mediators, and that is what Mr. Zelensky has said. Okay. He has identified possibly Saudi Arabia as a country which uh, can play the role. It has been proactive as far as uh, uh, trying to find solutions. and it could play a mediatory role between russia and ukraine to bring the two together and to try to find some sort of a compromise uh, general sudhakar uh, the russian uh, rhetoric uh, right from the time when it uh, you know i mean in 2022 when it started uh, its uh, military operation has been that ukraine is historically russian land now prime of ac that appears to be expansionist uh, declaring an intent to restore the russian hegemony or the soviet union hegemony what do you think i mean uh, is that the larger threat that europe and nato are thinking uh, russia i mean if they give in or they uh, sub compromise uh, russia would be emboldened uh mark well said uh, mm. i must compliment you for the articulation but let me also share the fact that uh, it is not russia but the western alliance which is actually exercising the power of rhetoric today if nato has said something or mr blinken has made a statement about couple of hours back today in the morning that ukraine is going to be given the membership of uh, the nato very soon yes and also they have given a declaration or a assuring commitment that there is going to be a long term Uh, long term uh, kind of assistance of 107 billion dollars over next 5 years, years yes. uh, well this is uh, to me and to my analysis and research i have been a student of geopolitics to me it appears to be a big farce and big rhetoric no country in the world even if it is a superpower today and mindful of the fact that they are going for the elections four to five months from now and donald trump knocking the door of success he is actually you know okay. he is asserting himself if donald trump comes to the power the biggest challenge before the world today is the transatlantic relationship 
today right. if there is an architecture which is holding out the peace and harmony in some form or some kind of a semblance of international rules based international order then it is because of the transatlantic relationship i fear mark okay. my apprehensions are that should donald trump come there is a a greater apprehension and fear of losing out the european union or the yes. or the member in the europe itself so therefore okay. it brings last point in response to your question is that today if we have to bring in some peace and harmony and bring some logical conclusion to this conflict which is ongoing in the central europe then perhaps it is the western alliance which has to actually okay introspect as to where have they gone wrong why are they forgetting about james baker sure. who came in 1990s or 91 to meet mikhail garvochov and gave him a commitment okay. that not an inch to the east will ever move post Uh, the collapse sure. of the bond. Uh, I'm afraid we've run short of time. I, I just want the last word in from uh, Ambassador Sajjanhar. You know, can Russia be persuaded to compromise if NATO and EU soften their stance? Uh, I mean, after all, uh, the Russian economy needs Europe as much as uh, they need Russia. Yeah, you're very right. I think uh, both the sides uh, need uh, to come to a compromise, but both the sides are demanding that <clears throat> the compromise should be on their own terms. What uh, Ukraine wants is that the territorial boundaries should be restored to what it was in 2014 and of course uh, Russia wants that uh, would want that 18% of the territory that it has captured that it should stay with it so their positions are far apart but i think the final solution the end of a conflict has to be on the negotiating table with a compromise what okay. that compromise is going to be I think that is uh, the finding the terms of that compromise that is going to be the challenge and uh, that I'm sure uh, next few months or maybe even a year would uh, be required to come to some sort of uh, understanding on this mark right uh, thank you very much uh, ambassador sajjanhar as well as uh, major general sudhakar thank you for joining us and putting throwing light on this interesting subject uh, moving on then india's space achievements can now be seen as an animated show at a planetarium in the southern state of karnataka in bengaluru now to inform youngsters and evoke an interest in them about india's space missions the nehru planetarium there in bengaluru will be showcasing a sky show produced by the Indian Space Research Organization ISRO the theme of the show is Indian Space Odyssey sounding rockets to gaganyaan aisha khanam reports the planetarium shows in bangalore are no longer restricted to watching the milky way galaxy or stargazing The Indian Space Research Organization is now simplifying its success stories and bringing it to the young minds. The Gaganyaan story will now be seen in the planetarium in simple language which the students and common man can understand. The 30-minute show's prime highlight is its animation of the various aspects of the Gaganyaan mission and the accurate replication of the spacecraft through various videos and visuals of the process. The video discusses the training of four astronauts at the Human Space Flight Center along with the meticulous preparation for the launch. Speaking at the premiere of the Odyssey show, AS Kiran Kumar, former chairman of ISRO, said if we want more space activities in the country, we should bring the narrative forward with such videos. Space mining activities. The government is also looking at how Indians can land on moon by 2040. so it's exciting times ahead but then if more and more space activities have to happen in the country we also need to make sure that we bring in this narrative to the next generation and the public and through these such activities make them aware of what is happening post chandrayaan 3's success the interest of the youngsters in aerospace has grown manifold This special show is open to public every day at the planetarium. The JNP is also making efforts to take the sky show to other states across the country. Aisha Khanum reports for DD India. Well, with the hottest summer predicted in India this year, the eastern city of Bhubaneswar in Odisha recorded the season's highest temperature at 43.5 degrees Celsius on Saturday. Eight people were admitted to different hospitals due to heat-related issues. 
According to weather authorities, severe heat wave will last for the next two days. India's National Stock Exchange is uh, launching four new indices in cash and futures and options segments starting tomorrow. These new indices aim to provide investors expanded opportunities in various sectors of the market. So still to come here on DD, on DD India News are, well, the Mumbai Indians have finally won a match in the IPL uh, season 2024, and it was a convincing win at the uh, Wanka Day. The theme for this year's World Health Day is My Health, My Right. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India. You're watching DD India News, huh? I'm Mark Lynn. A total solar eclipse is set to occur on the 8th of April. The celestial phenomenon where the moon completely obscures the sun, casting a shadow on the earth, will move across Mexico, the United States and Canada, but it will not be visible from the Indian subcontinent. The eclipse is set to commence over the South Pacific Ocean with the first point of contact on continental North America being Mexico's Pacific coast at approximately 11.07 a.m. Uh, so many changes will occur during this solar eclipse. This will be a total solar eclipse and it would be memorable uh, as it's going to occur for the first time in 54 years, a total solar eclipse. In an era marked by unprecedented challenges, the value of good health has never been more apparent. The World Health Day is being observed uh, every year on April 7th. And this year, the theme of the celebration is My Health, My Right. Let's look at this brief report. World Health Day is being commemorated every year across the globe. On April 7, annually, the day is observed in order to raise awareness about global health issues and highlight the importance of well-being. The theme for the World Health Day 2024 is My Health, My Right, which focuses on the fundamental human right, access to quality health care, education and information. The origin of World Health Day goes back to 1948, when First Health Assembly was held by the organization, where it was decided to commemorate April 7, also the founding day of the World Health Organization, as World Health Day. To celebrate this day, people from around the globe come together to promote a healthier world for everyone. It serves an important platform for raising awareness about important health issues and advocating for equitable access to health care worldwide. From AI-driven diagnostics and wearable health devices to remote patient monitoring, the future holds a promise for revolutionizing how we deliver emergency medical services. In today's rapidly evolving healthcare landscape, it is essential to champion patients' rights and drive innovation that puts the individual at the center of care. The day underscores the importance of primary health care facilities and availability of clean water. It also highlights the health challenges and focuses on the health facilities that should be provided to a human being. Good health and well-being are important and fundamental to leading a healthy and fulfilling life. It encompasses physical, mental and social well-being, enabling individuals to contribute positively to society. Nitendra Singh report, DD India. Markets in Indonesia's capital Jakarta were bustling as the world's second largest Muslim population prepared for Eid al-Fitr celebrations and festivities. 
The Indonesian Muslims will usher in the Eid festival on Thursday. Locals were seen rushing to shops to buy food, snacks and clothing for the celebrations which mark the holy month of Ramadan. Now, as Ramadan draws to a close, uh, Muslims worldwide gear up for the Eid al-Fatr uh, celebrations next week, marking the end of the month of fasting and also spiritual introspection. Determined by the lunar Hijri calendar, Ramadan's length varies, with Muslims eagerly awaiting the crescent moon sighting to commence Eid celebrations. In the UAE, the moon sighting committee will meet Monday evening to spot the moon, deciding whether Eid falls on April 9th or April 10, fostering anticipation and unity among the faithful. During the month of Ramadan, various initiatives took place as the Consulate General of India in Dubai spearheaded outreach to the blue-collar workers in the UAE, conducting a labor awareness program, medical camps and sessions on financial literacy. So with Eid al-Fitr around the corner, people in Bangladesh also continue to leave cities to celebrate with their families. Passengers in large numbers were seen rushing to the Dhaka railway station, to the bus and launch terminals to avoid last hour hassles and chaos. Various stretches of the highway reported long queues of vehicles leaving Dhaka. According to an estimate, around 15 million people were moving around. Let's bring you the sports news now. And moving on to the Indian Premier League, uh, the Mumbai Indians ended their three-match losing streak this season after trouncing Delhi Capitals by 29 runs in Mumbai to clinch their maiden win in this season. The hosts posted 234 runs for the loss of five wickets after Romario Shepard smashed 32 runs in the final over of the T20 match and Shepard came out of nowhere to slam a 10-ball 39. Shepard and Tim David added 53 runs in the last three overs to help Mumbai Indians set up an imposing total. In reply, Delhi Capitals lost the opener David Warner early. Prithvi Shaw and Abhishek Porel added 88 runs to keep the visitors in the hunt. But after batters failed to measure up to the challenge, Jaspreet Bumrah snapped up both Shaw and Porel to put the brakes on the Capitals' scoring rate. Now, as the run rate began to mount, Tristan Stubb went ballistic to make a 25 ball 71. He was not out, but uh, the right-handed batter smacked seven sixes and three fours, but his effort could only reduce the margin of defeat for Delhi, who lost a flurry of wickets towards the end and ended up with 205 for eight in their allotted overs. In men's hockey, India went down against Australia 2-4. In the second match of the five-match series at Perth on Sunday, India led at the half-time 2-1 despite trailing uh, to an early goal. Drag flicks from Jugraj Singh and Harman Preet Singh put them in a good position, but in the third quarter, blitz, the Australians stormed back with three goals. Uh, for Australia, Jeremy Hayward scored a brace, while Anderson, Jacob and Nathan Ephraimus netted one goal each. Now India trail uh, the five-match series to Australia 0-2. Uh, they, lo they lost the first match 5-1. That's all we have in this edition of DD India News Hour. Let's know your thoughts on the news of the day. Connect with us on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Mark Lin. From all of us here in Delhi, thank you very much for watching DD India News Hour. Namaskar.